I love psychedelics, and I'm so glad that the country is moving towards societal acceptance of psychedelic assisted therapy as a form of mental health treatment. But this video isn't about that. In fact, it's about the opposite. Psychedelics may have the potential to heal our minds, but as much good as they're capable of bringing, there's historical evidence pointing to its massively destructive potential. As the country inches closer and closer to widespread legalization of psychedelics, particularly psilocybin mushrooms, aka hallucinogenic mushrooms, I'm reminded of the consequences of the first time we saw a massive surge in demand for these magic mushrooms, as well as their prominent role in a literal genocide. This is something that nobody is talking about. I've read a lot of literature on psilocybin in preparation for this video, and what I'm about to tell you is just something writers everywhere are completely omitting. It's my hope that by talking about the forgotten history of magic mushrooms, we may avoid the mistakes of the past and help create a better, healthier future for us all. The story begins with Robert Gordon Wasson, also known simply as R. Gordon Wasson. He was a multimillionaire vice president of public relations at J.P. Morgan and Company which is the predecessor to three of the largest international banks today, J.P. Morgan Chase, Morgan Stanley, and Deutsche Bank. Most people know him as the single person who brought the potential benefits of psilocybin to the Western world in a 1957 Life magazine expose. But what most people are unaware of is what happened in the immediate aftermath. While Watson's famous article was published in 1957, the full story actually begins 30 years earlier in 1927. R. Gordon Watson had just married Valentina Pavlona Gurkin. While on their honeymoon, the couple perchance upon a wild batch of mushrooms. Valentina was excited to cook the mushrooms, but Robert, he feared poisoning and was not quite ready to become a widower just yet. He would later write, I knew nothing about the fungal world and felt that the less I knew about those putrid, treacherous excrenenses Excre extra what the fuck are you pronounce? Excrescence. Excrescence. Right. I knew nothing about the fungal world and felt that the less I knew about those putrid, treacherous excrescence, the better. For her, they were things of grace, infinitely inviting to the perceptive mind. She insisted on gathering them. Laughing at my protests, mocking my horror, she brought a skirtful back to the lodge. She cleaned and cooked them. That evening, she ate them alone. So why was Valentina so eager to eat the batch of wild mushrooms while Robert so fearful? The answer laid in their past. You recall that Valentina had a Russian maiden name, Gherkin. And for the record, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I've looked for pronunciations everywhere, but everybody else is literally just guessing. This uh, Russian woman, Valentina Pavlovna Gurkin. I don't know if I pronounced that right, but she's not here to correct me, so it'll have to go as I said it. The point is, she was Russian. She was born in Russia to two Russian parents, and while she spent most of her childhood in the United States, her formative years were still under a heavy Russian influence. Watson, derived from Watts, is an Anglo-Saxon name. Our Gordon Watson's family originated in Britain. Both Robert and Valentina came from two completely different backgrounds, with two completely different perceptions of mushrooms. They coined the terms mycophiles and mycophobes. The mycoprefix is derived from the Greek word mykes, which means fungus. So mycology is a study of fungus, mycosis is a fungus-infected disease, and a mycoparasite is an organism able to enter a parasitic relationship with a piece of fungus. The phyles root means love. For example, an audiophile, is a lover of high fidelity sound, often music, and a cinephile is someone who loves movies. Tell Michael Bolton is a major cinephile. You complete me! Yeah, yeah, okay. The phobes root means fear, such as a germaphobe who's afraid of germs and a hydrophobe who's afraid of water. I'd originally had a joke here where I would wonder how a hydrophobe goes about their daily lives how they get their 8 cups of water a day, if they could even shower, that kind of stuff. 
I cut it out because I didn't want people to miss a joke and think a hydrophobe was actually someone afraid of water. In reality, it's a molecular property in which a molecule is repelled by water. Anyway. Digging through their history, they begun to find more and more evidence of a divergent attitude towards mushrooms between the Greeks, Celtics, Scandinavians, and Anglo-Saxons versus the Russians, Serbs, and Catalans. For example, Shaga. Shaga looks like a burnt piece of charcoal, but it's a type of fungus that's used as a traditional Russian remedy to boost the immune system. But how did these different cultures adopt such wildly different outlooks on mushrooms? That's the question that followed Robert and Valentina for the rest of their lives. And so, in 1953, R. Gordon Watson embarked on his first trip down to the isolated mountain villages of southern Mexico. Mexico is split up into different states. Of these, Oaxaca is a state best known for both its indigenous people and culture, as well as a rich biodiverse habitat, including plants, mammals, and most importantly, fungi. This could be why an informant tipped Watson off that Huatula, a small village in the remote Oaxacan mountains, lived healers who practiced their craft with the help of native mushrooms. Watson spent the better part of five years trampling around Oaxaca, searching for leaves of a mushroom healer, but nobody was too eager to help. To explain why, we have to go back 500 years in time. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition! Contrary to what Monty Python appears to have believed, everybody saw the Spanish Inquisition coming. The Christian kingdom spent nearly 800 years from 711 to 1492 AD locked in a bloody religious war with the Islamic Caliphates, the then big dick religious mega superpower. The fights over the future of religious domination were essentially a series of loosely connected wars. We refer to this period as Reconquista meaning reconquest in Spanish and Portuguese. Like its name suggests, these fights were efforts from the Christian kingdoms to spread Christendom to the non-practicing populations. The Crusades are a commonly referenced example, having taken place between the years 1095 and 1271. And the Christians were successful. The Spanish crown of Castile conquered the final Islamic state in 1492. Drunk off their big dicks and war monitoring success of dominating the Islamic Caliphates, the Catholics then turned their attention to the newly created Spanish territories. Most of these were still small colonies and still practiced local pagan religions. One of these was the Aztec Empire, located in present-day Mexico, where Oaxaca is located at. I'm sure most of you can see where this is going now. The Spanish Inquisition was an absolutely brutal period in history, when the Spanish Catholics looted, tortured, and killed their way through a 400 year long mass religious conversion. Their preferred method of torture was a primitive waterboarding equivalent, where the victim would have a piece of cloth placed over their mouth before water gets poured on them, giving them the sensation of drowning while still, according to the Inquisitors, being harmless and very safe. The church declared in 1602 that the use of plants in religious or spiritual ceremonies was an unforgivable sin. It certainly didn't help the Aztecs that their word for mushrooms, pronounced Teonanacotl, literally translated to God's flesh. Named so because the Aztecs believed that consuming the mushrooms granted its ingester a direct line of contact to the divine which was obviously completely unacceptable to the church. After all, the church derived its power from being the only institution with access to God. If any old geezer could commune with God by eating mushrooms growing under some random trees in the wilderness, then the church would lose all of its authority overnight. This fear is why the Spaniards spent years savagely kidnapping, torturing, and killing anyone with a non-Christian bone in them destroying its cultural history and artifacts in the process. You can understand now why in the mid 20th century, the local Oaxacans were still reluctant to talk to an outsider about their historical cultural practices involving mushrooms. And so Watson struggled for years to find a mushroom healer. 
It wasn't until 1955 when he met a 61-year-old Maztec woman named Maria Sabina that he finally made some real progress. Maria was a well-respected curandera of her village. A curandera is a healer slash shaman specializing in traditional remedies like cultural mushrooms. But what's important to note is that the centuries of brutal religious conversion at the hands of the Spaniards worked. By the mid-20th century, most of the region were Catholic of faith. Very few non-Catholics still lived in the area, and even less were actively practicing their ancestral faith. So while the conception of Maria today would be of a wise elderly healer using plants and fungi to forge a relationship with the divine, she was in actuality more like a healer and a seeker. Not a quitter seeker, though I'm sure she would have been fabulous in the mid 2000 but a seeker of information. If you were sick, she would help you figure out what's wrong. If you were really sick, she would tell you when you're going to die. Wasson knew this, writing, The Indians consult the mushrooms when distraught with grave problems. If someone is ill, the mushroom will say what led to the illness and whether the patient will live or die, and what should be done to hasten recovery. If the verdict of the mushroom is for death, the believing patient and his family resign themselves. He loses appetite and soon expires, and even before his death, they begin preparations for the wake. Or one may consult the mushrooms about the stolen donkey and learn it will be found and who took it. Or if a beloved son has gone out into the world, perhaps to the United States, the mushroom is a kind of a postal service. It will report whether he still lives or is dead, whether he is in jail, married, in trouble, or prosperous. The Indians believe that the mushrooms hold the key to what we call extrasensory perception. Which is why he cooked up a fake story about his son who was missing back home in New York. and begged Maria for information on his lost son. It was her desire to help Watson find information on his son that led to her taking him and his photographer to a dirt-covered basement, where they were each given a dozen hallucinogenic mushrooms to chew. While the lies about Watson seeking the whereabouts and well-being of his son were completely fake, he later discovered that the information gleaned from the visions with Maria's mushrooms were uncannily accurate. The experience was chronicled in the 1957 Life magazine article, Seeking the Magic Mushroom, the last copy of which sold for an astonishing $300 on eBay. Thankfully for my Featherlight wallet and the research of this video, there are copies of this article online to read for free. Among the highlights of the article includes, I was viewing a world of which I was not a part and with which I could not establish contact. There I was, poised in space, a disembodied eye, invisible, incorporeal, seeing but not seen. These visions were not blurred or uncertain. They were sharply focused, the lines and colors being so sharp that they seemed more real to me than anything I had ever seen with my own eyes. I felt that I was now seeing plain, whereas ordinary vision gives us an imperfect view. This was a mushroom speaking through her, her being Maria Sabina. She had her name changed in the article to Ava Mendez for anonymity reasons. God's words. This was the oracle. The article included a photo with the caption, A drawing of 16th century shows three mushrooms, a man eating them, and a god behind him, who is speaking through the mushroom. My immediate impression after reading Watson's description with the mushrooms is that he really missed his calling of being a poet. Given the lofty, surreal account, I'm sure you won't find it too surprising that Seeking the Magic Mushroom went absolutely viral in the United States. Everybody wanted to try the hallucinogenic mushrooms and experience, including the musicians Bob Dylan, John Lennon, and Mick Jagger. I mean, who wouldn't want to channel God through their bodies? This massive influx of tourists completely devastated the population, 
The problem with all this emphasis on God and mysticism is that for their indigenous populations the mushrooms were taken from, the experience of the mushrooms wasn't about God and the universe. Again, at that point, the majority of the population were already Catholics. The mushrooms' whole purpose was to heal the eater. The hallucinations were merely a side effect of the process. As the quiet village was transformed from a peaceful hamlet to a spiritual mecca for, in the words of Watson, hippies, psychopaths, adventurers, pseudo-research workers, the miscellaneous crews of society's dropouts. Previously, the mushrooms could only be gathered in the early morning before sunrise in secret locations known only to the elders. Watson's 1957 Life magazine article created such a massive demand for the mushrooms that it created a black market within Huatula. The sudden surge of tourists led to a spike in crime, which was followed by ineffective new laws in an attempt to keep the area under some semblance of peace and order. Wasson grew to deeply regret his role in the ruin of Huatula, lamenting in the 1970s New York Times article titled Drugs, the Secret Mushroom, What I have done gives me nightmares. I have unleashed on lovely Huatula a torrent of commercial exploitation of the vilest kind, and that the whole of the countryside is agog with the furtive movements of hippies, the comings and goings of the federalistas, the dogberries with their blundering efforts to root them out. I, Gordon Watson, am held responsible for the end of a religious practice in Mesoamerica that goes back far, for a millennia. I've got no idea why everything Watson wrote sounded either lyrical or like a legal contract, but that regret pales in comparison to that of Maria Sabinas, the one who first introduced Watson, and subsequently the world, to the mushrooms in 1957. For her role in the destruction of her village, she was banished, arrested for a period, and had her house burned down. Worst of all, her son was even murdered. She would later say, Never, as far as I remember, were the saint children eaten with such a lack of respect. Saint children was a personification of the psilocybin mushrooms and the visions that they produced. From the moment the foreigners arrived to search for God, the saint children lost their purity. They lost their force. The foreigners spoiled them. From now on, they won't be any good. The two world wars created a massive surge in chemical research and its potential use as medicine. For example, what we know today as chemotherapy has its roots in the mustard gas used in the trenches of World War I. I did another video on that in the topic, link in the description down below. Investments into new pharmaceutical chemicals were especially popular, including the potential of new treatment to be used to treat mental illnesses. And remember who R. Gordon Wasson was when he started his journey into mushrooms? Now, I'm not laying out any accusations. Nothing has ever been proved, but just look at the facts in the timeline and come up with your own conclusions. 1. After World War II, investment firms started looking to new chemical pharmaceuticals. 2. A prominent investment banker marries a Russian woman who grew up being exposed to alternate Russian folk medicine. 3. On their honeymoon, the newlywed couple found a wild batch of mushrooms. Certain types of mushrooms are used in traditional Russian medicine to treat various ailments. 4. The investment banker visits various indigenous Mexican villages to seek information on unfamiliar chemicals that could be used to make new pharmaceuticals. 5. The investment banker experiences those new chemicals and writes a gushing article about the experience in a popular magazine pushing the idea of mushrooms being used as medicine to the forefront of the American public. 6. An entire counterculture movement is created revolving around these chemicals and their potential pharmaceutical effects. 
Again, I'm not accusing Watson of anything. We don't have any way of knowing what his motivations were. And even if he was initially driven by the thought of his bank seeding early investments into the new pharmaceutical industry, it's pretty clear that he ended up regretting exposing the mushrooms to the Western world. Which, I guess is a good sentiment? But it doesn't change the fact that communities were destroyed and lives were lost. The commercial exploitation of psilocybin mushrooms in 1957, possibly led by the desire for Wall Street to invest in new pharmaceuticals, brought ruin to a small community. Who were the brutal victims of an earlier cultural and human genocide for their use of their mushrooms? And now I am worried that something similar is about to happen again. Maria Sabina said in an interview many years later that, before Watson, nobody took the mushrooms only to find God. The sentiment of using mushrooms to boost your spiritual levels was just a notion co-opted by Western society. When the idea of a chemical compound that lets you talk to God becomes widely accepted, people will do drastic things for that experience. Okay. A rural, a rural village, a rural village probably won't be destroyed this time. In all likelihood, no one will be banished from the only home they knew. Nobody would die, and no houses would be set on fire. Hopefully. But let's be frank. If recent events have taught us anything, it's that the average American isn't exactly level-headed. I know you might be rolling your eyes right now at the suggestion that we could have a repeat of 1957. But there's already some evidence of opportunists abusing the properties of psilocybin mushrooms for their own personal benefits at the expense of the community around them. Which I'll talk about in an upcoming video.